Hey there, welcome to the Kim Constable podcast. This is your host, Kim Constable. Nobody cares, work harder. How are you guys doing today? So excited to be here for another episode of the podcast. I actually missed recording last week. And I have to be honest, it's because I was away in Beirut with my husband um, in the south of France. Um, I was working hard, actually. You wouldn't think that I was, but one of the things that I do whenever... Um, I'm super busy quite often is I will go away to the likes of um, Beirut or to Marbella or Barcelona or somewhere um, luxurious and uh, quiet. And I will spend that time working my little ass off because it's a really, really productive time for me. It's a time whenever I can get absolutely loads done. And so um, it is one of my favorite things to do. And that's what I did last week. So I didn't actually record an episode of the podcast. Um, I've just turned down the volume in this podcast because I realized I was like, oh my God, like it's so loud in my own ears. This is why I wear headphones. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube and you're not listening, I wear headphones so that I can hear my own voice back because I have a tendency to shout whenever I'm recording the podcast or anytime I get excited, I tend to shout. So if I wear the, the headphones, it stops me from shouting and keeps the sound nice and luxurious because let me tell you, there's nothing worse than listening to a podcast that has crap sound. Like it's one of my pet hates. Um, so hopefully Hopefully you guys find the sound in this podcast good. So I'm sorry I missed last week, but I'm back with another episode today. And I have to be honest, I was really feeling very uninspired this week. I was like, I'm going to talk about the podcast this week. Like I genuinely was feeling quite uninspired. Um, and so anyway, I went into my previous podcast notes. I thought I'll just, you know, jot some stuff down. Quite often I go through my Facebook groups whenever I'm looking for inspiration as to what I'm going to talk about in the podcast, um, because it is quite hard doing it the way I do it. A lot of people whenever they record podcasts, the reason why they do a lot of interviews is because it's very easy to do interviews because all you have to do is just listen to the person. You're not actually the one really doing the talking and you don't have to come up with interesting subjects. But I, as I've said before, <laughs> find interviews, most interviewees, many interviewees, not all because I haven't really interviewed very many people, but I find many of them to be boring um, and not even boring, just that, you know, they I don't know. I don't like listening to interviews myself. So I prefer to learn while I'm walking or doing cardio or doing something. So that's why I do the podcast the way I do it. But doing it this way makes it super difficult because I always have to come up with new and original and interesting content and stories. So anyway, I went through my notes uh, the other week. Uh, sorry, I went through my notes earlier to see, you know, previous podcast episodes. And I just happened to click on one, which was, it must have been one I did last year or a couple of years ago, which was 10 things that you probably don't know about me. And that kind of inspired me. And I thought, you know what I'm going to do today? I know that this won't be interesting to many of you who uh, don't follow me for business content or who are part of my Sculpted Vegan Network for fitness content. But today I'm going to talk about how I built a multi-million dollar global fitness empire in just under six years. The reason why I'm inspired to talk about this and kind of give you step-by-step -step, um, instructions really of how I did it, as well as loads of stories and stuff peppered in there, is because I, I have a financial controller in the company um, who works for me full-time. She manages all of the finances of the company. She's amazing. Her name is Elaine love you, Elaine. But I also have an accountancy firm who manages all of my end of year accounts and does all my submission of my company accounts. And I met with um, Elaine, I met with Siobhan today, who um, just to give them a wee shout out, the company is G McG. Uh, they are uh, based in Lisburn in Northern Ireland in County Down. So a little shout out for G McG. They are a superb accountancy firm. Siobhan has been with me from the very beginning, from day dot. And it's funny because we were meeting earlier and she said to me, oh, I love all your pictures in the background because I'm here in my office. For those of you who are watching, you know, on YouTube, um, you can see all the pictures, all my magazine covers in the background. And I was doing kind of a wee pan around and showing her my office, you know, on Zoom. And she said, God, Kim, I remember whenever you walked into my office six years ago, she said you were... She said, um, you walked in with all these big ideas and, you know, and you were telling me how much money you were going to make. And she said, and honestly, as we sat down and went through these figures, I was thinking this girl's on another planet. There's no way on God's green earth she is going to do the kind of money that she thinks she's going to do, you know, in the next 12 to 24 months. And she said, and dear 
God, did you prove me wrong? She said, I have, honestly, I am very happy to admit that I was completely wrong about you. She said, not only have you gone on to do more than you thought you would do, but you've exceeded my wildest expectations. And I, we were laughing about it. And it really made me think about how far I've come in the last six months or last six months, last six years, really. And I thought that many of you don't really know the story of how it all started. And I do get a lot of questions about the business and how I did it. Because obviously there's, you know, it's a it's a multi-billion dollar industry, the fitness industry. There's a lot of people online who are trying to be successful, really trying to make it work. And some are moderately successful, some are more successful than others. But I don't know that there's any other, certainly not in the vegan industry. I don't know that there are that there's anybody else doing fitness programs the way that I'm doing it. Certainly not any other female that I know of. I mean, there are some very, very successful females. Um, and I don't really know that much about their businesses, to be honest. But anyway, what I'm doing is certainly unique, absolutely unique in the vegan community. And I just thought I would share a little bit about my journey and where I got to be where I am today. And if you guys are interested in this episode and you want a follow-up episode, uh, which I could talk about where the business is headed now and what changes we're making and what changes we've made in the last couple of months, and I'm more than happy to talk about that as well. So uh, here goes. How did it all start? Well, Many of you won't actually know that it all started way back in 2011. And I have told the story a few times, so I won't elaborate on it too much here about how after my fourth son was born, I really found myself very, very, very overwhelmed, exhausted, and quite honestly at my wit's end because I didn't mean to have a fourth baby so soon after my third. I actually had had a miscarriage between Kai, my second son, and Maya, my daughter, who's number three. I'd had a miscarriage between them, so I would have had a baby much closer in age to Kai. But anyway, um, that, that that was fine. I had a miscarriage, and then I got pregnant again with Maya. And I really did find having three children under the age of four, it was at the time, I think very, very challenging. I mean, Corey was probably maybe only three. No, he was four whenever Maya was born. Um, and so I did find that very, very challenging. And so I did not want or expect to get pregnant very quickly with Jack. Now, Maya was only 13 months whenever I found out I was pregnant with Jack. It was completely unexpected. He was a missed pill baby. It was like one of those ones where you wake up, wake up in the morning and you go, shit, I forgot to take my pill yesterday. And the dirty deed had happened the night before. So it was like, what do I do? Am I going to be pregnant? I was like, no, I'll be fine. Well, clearly I was not fine. And thank God I wasn't because obviously Jack is 11 now and he's a wonderful, wonderful child and we would not be without him. But it was obviously meant to be, but it was one of those things where I woke up and was like, oh my God. And then one morning I thought, oh, I'm sure my period should have come. It hadn't come. I bolted out of bed to the local supermarket at 6 a.m. on a Monday morning. It had only just opened at 6 a.m., bought a pregnancy test, came home, did it, pregnant was not happy about it at all. Um, Maya was only 13 months. She wasn't even walking yet. She was crawling around, constantly pulling herself up on me, wanting to be held. You know, Corey and Kai were still super young. I was struggling under, you know, trying to, I homeschooled the kids. So, which was obviously a choice, but it was really, 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 really tough. And um, then I found out I was pregnant with Jack honestly, it was just, it was really, really bad. I just did not want to be pregnant. So, but anyway, along he came and after he was born, I was like, that's it. Never having another one was sterilized very, very quickly. And, but that was fine. I got on with being a mother of four, but while Maya was young, I actually, whenever the boys were young, I had attempted to start, you know, a language company for children um, where I employed foreign people and, you know, to come in and speak languages for my kids and then for other kids. And so I was, you know, I was trying to run this business or grow this business at the same time as trying to parent my children, clean the house, cook for them, do the laundry, you know, make sure I kept them alive, all those kinds of things. And then whenever Jack came along, I was still running this business. And I remember standing in my office, my home office at the time, trying the day after he was born, trying to make my brain work, trying to do the schedule online, I had this big board in my office and I would have put down, you know, where the teachers were going, what homes they were going to, who was dropping them off, what was happening. And I literally just could not get my brain to work. Um, and and I just struggled so badly trying to fit it all in. And then he wasn't very old. He was only two or three 
weeks old. And I remember trying to get, you know, the kids did these activities like tennis and mini active and different things at the local gym. And I remember one afternoon trying to get them out the door to get them to their mini active class. And I love them going to mini active because it meant I got like 30 or 45 minutes like to myself sitting in the cafe with Jack. I usually put him on my chest and fell asleep for the first, you know, for like a good hour um, while the other ones were doing their mini active activities. But this particular day, I couldn't get them in the car. I remember it was like I was trying to get you know one of them in the car and trying to get their shoes on, and then the other one got out of the car and the other one took their shoes off. And Maya was you know, mommy, 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 and I'm, she wasn't even walking, so I had to pick her up and strap her in. She was screaming, and then Jack was in the carry cot, and it was absolute utter chaos. I was exhausted, I was emotionally exhausted. I it was it was terrible. So I just sank. I remember just sinking to my knees. I literally just I just broke and I just sank to my knees on the carpet in the middle of our hallway and I just put my head in my hands and I started to cry and I remember the kids patting me on the back you know awkwardly being like mommy mommy are you okay are you okay mommy and I remember feeling so bad that here I was on my knees crying in front of them and there was nothing that they could do but I really just had reached breaking point and it was in that moment that I decided something had to change I could not go on trying to parent my kids trying to run this business I thought I need to figure out a way to make money because even though my kids were young um, and I decided to homeschool them, I'd always tried to make my own money. And I always had made my own money, not not buckets of it, but I had done audio typing for a local um, a TV station and I had worked as a portrait artist. Many of you don't know that. I have I was actually a, a quite a, I was actually a very good pencil portrait artist. So I would have done portraits. People would have sent me photos of their kids. I would have created them into portraits and sent them back. Um, I earned modest incomes from all these different endeavors that I did over the years. Um, and then I started this other language company. But like I said, it was just too much to manage when the kids were young. And I thought there has to be something that I can do to make money from home, which means I don't have to go out and work because I was committed to homeschooling my kids. And that was not something I was prepared to give up on. So I thought there must be some way that I can make money. And I knew that going out and getting a job wasn't an option because there's no job that I could have got like in a cafe or a restaurant or anything that would have paid me enough to 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 warrant the childcare costs and the time away from the family. So that wasn't an option that I was willing to consider. So I just thought I need to figure out a way here that I can make more money. And so that is really what spawned me to start looking into the world of internet marketing. So this was in 2011 and the internet was not new by any means. Like it had really kind of been invented whenever I was in high school. So I think in about, I remember it being kind of two, um, I mean, I'm sure it was before this, but it came more wide stream whenever you could, you know, plug into your modem kind of thing and surf the net. And I remember trying to figure out how it all worked. And that was in about 1996. So, but this wasn't that long after, after this is 2011. Okay. So really not that, you know, long after 1996, 1997. And, um, the world of internet marketing was still pretty, pretty new. And so I remember um, whatever day it was, the kids had gone to one of their classes and I was sitting in the uh, cafe with with Jack um, and he was sleeping and he was only a tiny baby. And so I, I started looking through the internet and I had seen ebooks somewhere and I could see people, you know, people selling ebooks, people selling information products. And I remember thinking, I could maybe write an ebook. Like I can write pretty well. So that's when I started diving into the world of internet marketing. And so for the next uh, let me see, from 2011 to 2016, next five years, I really dove into the world of internet marketing. And I had set up various websites. And first of all, I, I wrote a blog. Um, I think if you search online, you will find it. It's actually, it, I called it, like I had no idea what to call it. I called it Lip Gloss Entrepreneurs. Lip Gloss Entrepreneurs. Like what the hell did that even mean? But I think it's still available on WordPress if you search for it and you can read some of my really early articles. It's really quite funny. So I started that blog and I committed to blogging every single day. So I wrote one article every day. I had no idea why I was doing it or what I was doing it for. I just knew that I had to do something. And I started following all the big, you know, people online. I was following Marie Forleo and Michael Hyatt and James Wedmore. And I started watching, um, um, who's the other one? Um, Melanie, some Melanie Duncan. I was following her. And so I started... I started researching um, a lot of stuff to do with online businesses and I actually, I'm reading books and 
all of my time became consumed with watching webinars. And then at the end of a webinar, of course, they always sold you something. And at the end of every webinar that I watched, um, because obviously webinars are free and they're free information. At the end of every webinar I watched, I always, always wanted to buy the product that they were selling. But of course, I wasn't in the position to put that product into action a lot of times. You know, I didn't have any money. Quite often I was doing the ironing while I was watching the webinar. But I, I watched, read and consumed every single piece of information that I could on building an online business. And then I created a company called the Work at Home Mums Network, um, which was, I think I invested $600 in an information product. It, it nearly killed me. I hid it from my husband because he would have killed me. $600 um, in this information product. I bought it and I used it as a blueprint to start the Work at Home Mums Network. It was called Create Your Network. Create Your Network was what the program was called um, by Cherie McConnell. And it basically taught you how to um, how to create your own network, which is what I did, the Work at Home Moms Network. But the problem with all of this was, and the Work at Home Moms Network was actually a really, really good idea because I did have a lot of experience earning money as a work at home mom, but I didn't have a lot of sales experience. And so like most people who start an online business, this is kind of the number one failing that a lot of people make is when they start an online business, they use their expertise to create an online course, but they don't create a way to sell it. They think that if they build it, people will come. And so I actually built a really kick-ass um, website. I built a really good um, members area. I actually got someone in India to do it. I discovered websites like People Per Hour and Fiverr. They were pretty new at the time. I got a really inexpensive website built in in India, which um, which at the time looked pretty good, looked pretty professional. I got a members area um, created. I, I recorded all my own videos. I taught myself video editing. Like I, I did everything in the beginning. It's it's so funny. I was sitting editing a video the other week. It was for the winner's announcement of the Extreme Body Makeover program. And Laura, the head trainer in the company was sitting beside me and I was sitting, I said to her, I'm just going to make this video quickly the, of the winner's announcement. So I'm sitting on my computer using iMovie, editing this video, adding in photos and, and writing in screens and whatever. And she was like, holy shit, is there anything you can't do? And I turned to her and I said, Laura, I did everything in the beginning, everything. I did all the Facebook ads. I created all the graphics. I did all the videos. I did all the video editing. I did everything in the beginning because I couldn't afford to hire somebody. But thank God I did do everything because anyone who has a successful business, their first business usually does everything. But that's what you have to do in order to be successful. So what happened was I, uh, the Work at Home Mobs Network was not successful because I could not afford to market it. I remember going to a Facebook ads company and asking them, you know, could they help or whatever. And their initial fee was, it was thousands of dollars. And I think it was like the minimum ad spend you had to guarantee was $10,000 a month. And I was like, why the hell would I ever afford $10,000 a month? So I did put out loads of free content and I just created loads of free videos and I uploaded them to YouTube and they're all still there in all of their horrific glory. And I just focused all my time, energy and attention into trying my best through the free channels, through Facebook business posting. Like I think that this is what people who start online businesses do in the beginning. They, they, they hustle, hustle, hustle hard through all the free channels. And whenever Instagram started, I started Instagram. So, you know, it was like I, I did everything I could through the free channels to sell. But the problem with this strategy is that it just stinks of desperation because you're not, you don't have any other channel to sell your products. So whenever you use social media, you're constantly trying to sell, 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 sell. And people know that you're trying to sell to them. And whenever people know that you're trying to sell to them, they become resistant. But this is what a lot of people who don't have any money do in the beginning. And I completely understand it, but it's a very flawed strategy because what you would really be better doing is finding some kind of investment and treating your business like a real business. And that was the mistake that I made in the beginning with the Work at Home Moms Network. Um, but the other thing is, there really wasn't an enormous market. One of the things I didn't I didn't think about at the time is work at home moms don't have a lot of money. And they don't have a lot of money or stay at home moms don't have a lot of money because usually they're stay at home moms on a single income. So they don't have a huge amount of money because you know their husband is working, so they don't have money to spend. So I really wasn't targeting a group of people that had a lot of money either. But I learned a lot. I failed and failed and failed. And so I learned an enormous amount. And then... 
um, many years later, I, I decided to give up the Work at Home Mums Network. I think I did it until 2015. So I really hammered at trying to start some kind of online business for about four years until I finally gave up. And I didn't think I started, I launched the Work at Home Mums Network until 2014, maybe I think it was. Um, I tried it for a year, didn't work. And in the end, I ended up closing down the whole thing and becoming a yoga teacher in 2015. I really just got fed up with that. I was like, I'm not, I'm, I'm done. I can't do it anymore. Um, and so I closed everything down and I became a yoga teacher. Now, what happened after that? I, I wasn't content with just being a yoga teacher because I'm not that kind of person. And so from there, the yoga, te the yoga teaching expanded into yoga workshops. And then I, they became really super popular, my detox workshops. And so I started running Facebook ads. Um, and I had, I taught my, this is, uh, this is when I taught myself Facebook ads. I actually bought a course online by a girl called Kim Garst. Um, really, really good course. Um, I taught myself very basic Facebook ads and I started running my own Facebook ads and my workshops became really, really good, um, really popular. And so I ended up making gross profit about £4,000 a month, about $5,000, $6,000 a month, depending on the exchange rate, for um, running these yoga detox workshops. And, that, and I only worked um, four hours a month. I worked two hours on a Sunday twice a month and I was earning £4,000 a month, which was a really, really good income for me at the time, considering how little you know I was working. And so what happened then was I started training in the gym it, very inadvertently. I wasn't, um, I just wanted to improve my glutes. I realized that they were getting quite saggy. They were beginning to look like, um, you know, an old woman's butt or whatever. And I thought, I don't want to have an old woman's butt. So I'm going to start training in the gym, I'm going to start training my glutes. A lot of you have heard this story. And so I bought a program, one of Emily Sky's programs, and I downloaded it. It was a four week program for building your glutes. I thought in four weeks, my glutes were going to look like Emily. Emily Skies. I will not lie. I was very disappointed at the end of four weeks that they did not look like Emily Skies, but that disappointment actually always stuck with me because I realized how when you sell someone a four-week program that's a four-week glute building program, they do expect in their inexperience that they're going to have your glutes at the end of four weeks. So you really have to manage people's expectations. But I also realized it would take me far, far, far longer than I ever thought possible to actually build some real muscle in my glutes. I just People always think you can build muscle far faster than you can. You really, really, really cannot. So here's how it all happened, right? Here's how it all happened quite quickly after that. I was building, so I started training in the gym, decided that I loved it, decided I want to do a bikini competition, found a trainer online who actually is one of the judges um, in all of our competitions, Curtis Brown, who happens to be the ex-husband of head trainer Laura Hutchinson in our company. It's all very incestuous. So uh, I hired Curtis, I went to train with him and I decided I was going to do a bikini competition. So this is where the magic started to happen. I had given up, now understand, I'd given up all online marketing at this stage. All I was doing was running Facebook ads and I was running my yoga detox business and I was teaching yoga privately at home. So I decided I was going to, um, I decided I was going to do a bikini competition. And so I said to Curtis, I have, you know, I'm going to do a bikini competition. Can you prep me? He said, 100%. So he said, the only problem is, he said, I can do all your training, but I don't know how to advise you on the diet because I'm not vegan. I'm not even vegetarian. And I've never trained a vegan before. And I said, like, don't worry. I run a detox, a yoga detox company. I'm a real foodie. I'm really into nutrition. You know, I can absolutely figure this out. So you don't need to worry about the food part. You just train me and tell me what my macros and calories should be. And you know, and I'll work out the rest. So I remember going home one day and thinking, okay, how am I going to figure this out? And then I thought, you know what? I've been around online marketing for years and years and years now. There is bound to be someone online who has created a program for vegan bodybuilders to get to the stage. Because obviously I had been in the world of Pinterest and internet marketing and email marketing and Facebook marketing and LinkedIn marketing and all of these different things. Like a lot of you don't know, a lot of you know Lewis Howes, right? Who has the podcast, I think it's the online the business school of greatness or the online school of greatness or something. He's very, very, very well known online. Lewis actually started years ago as a LinkedIn expert teaching people through online courses how to improve their LinkedIn profile. I kid you not. I listened to a masterclass with him years ago. So um, I had done masterclasses on everything. I knew that there were programs on every single aspect of building a business that you could possibly imagine. So I just assumed that the same would exist in the fitness world because I was very, very 
Ufe with the fitness world. Now, this is in 2016, okay? Or was it 2015? 2016, I think. And I, at the time, thought, you know, like I just assumed, like, no, sorry, it, the internet wasn't the first place that people automatically went to buy online programs, right? You would have gone there for business, but not necessarily for fitness. Um, but because I had experience in the business world, I thought, well, someone is bound to have done this. So I went online and I started searching for, I just put into Google, um, vegan bodybuilding stage program, vegan bikini athlete stage program. And a couple of things came up. The first one was uh, Chrissy Carvalho, who's the vegan fitness model. I think she's uh, she comes up as, and I looked at her, I was like, oh, she looks amazing. I was looking through her website, looks great. Yep, she's in my demographic. And then I, I looked and she only had coaching packages. She had like bronze, silver, and gold coaching packages. So her coaching packages opened at a certain time of year and then closed again. And I was fully willing and prepared to spend about 2,000 pounds. That's what my budget was in my mind because I knew that the expensive programs, expensive business programs like Marie Forley was B-School, it was $2,000. So I had in my mind, okay, I will spend up to 2,000 dollars on this program there's bound to be one that exists that's about 12 months long that's I and I want a done for you resource right I don't want I don't want like coaching online coaching that kind of stuff I actually want just something I can download plug and play and do myself because I'm that kind of person and so Chrissy Carvalho came up and I was like no that doesn't that doesn't work because I don't want you know kind of coaching so I kept searching and then of course Robert Cheek who's the vegan bodybuilder he came up and I was like no that's, he doesn't have that and then someone else came up fit vegan it wasn't fit vegan chef I know Natalie Matthews very well now but it was um sexy fit vegan or something I'm not her not sure who she is but hers came up but again it was just cookbooks and free resources and I knew specifically what I was looking for I was looking for the program that would help me to get to the stage as a vegan bikini athlete and as I was searching and searching and searching, I realized it didn't exist. And I was like, ding, 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 ding. It was like, you know, ding, 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 jackpot. As I was sitting in my office, searching through the internet for this thing that did not exist, I suddenly realized that I had an opportunity to create it. And I remember the moment when I was thinking, this doesn't exist if I'm searching for this, then I can then I can guarantee that there are other women around the world also searching for this because there are billions of people on this planet. And I can't be the only one who's vegan who wants to do a bikini competition because veganism was really on the rise at the time. Like it was a rising market. I hadn't been vegan for that long. I think maybe only, um, I want to say a year maybe. So I was a pretty new vegan. I'd been vegetarian for a long time, but not vegan. And it really was on the rise. And I remember thinking, this is a real opportunity. I have to create this. And once the idea penetrated my brain, I could not get rid of it. And I just, I mean, I could not get rid of it. It was there. It was in there. I just knew, you know, whenever you just know that something is a good idea, you know, your intuition, your spidey sense, if you like, it just goes off and it goes, this is an epic idea. So I remember going to my husband at the time and saying, I am going to create a program and I, you know, for vegan women who want to step on stage. And I told him about it and he was like, you're going to create a, and I was like, and it's going to be long. It's going to be like 12 months. It's going. To, it's not going to be like a four week program. Because I remember whenever I bought Emily Skies and it was only four weeks and I thought that my I could grow my glutes in four weeks and, and you can't. So I want to give women a realistic, a realistic, you know, um, time frame for how they can step on stage. And I remember him going, you're going to create a 12 month program that costs a thousand dollars for vegan women over the age of 40 who want to look like a bodybuilder. And I was like, mm hmm. Yep. Uh huh. He was like, no, Kim, there's no way this is going to work. And he was like, absolutely not in a million years. The market is not there. You're crazy. But that's only because he was a man, right? He couldn't see that this was something that, you know, that he wanted, but I don't, that women want. I don't know what it was. I just knew that it was going to be an absolutely brilliant idea. So I went to Curtis the next day and I, I went for my training and I arrived with a, a, with a notepad and, and pen. And he was like, what's the notepad for? I was like, from now on. I'm going to be recording every single workout we do. And I started to tell him what I was going to create. And I went and, and he was like, oh, that's actually a really epic idea. He thought it was a brilliant idea. 
And so I started to record every workout. I started to do, you know, I created a Facebook community. I started to share on my my personal Facebook videos of me training. I, I started an Instagram account. I started studying all of the Instagrammers who had really big accounts who were doing it really, really well. Um, and I started studying, you know, what they did and why their photographs were amazing and why they got so much engagement. And I started to copy it effectively or not copy it, but try to emulate it, if you like. And this is what I started to work on. So but here's here was the biggest thing that I that I realized, right, from all of my failures with trying online. I knew that I could create this absolutely amazing program. But if I didn't figure out a way to sell it, it would never be successful. Because I had tried and failed to start so many online businesses and I had created really kick-ass programs but I had no way to sell them. And I knew that this was my downfall. And so I, the other thing was because I'd spent all those years watching webinars, I knew how effective webinars were because every single webinar that I had been on, I had wanted to buy the program at the end. And if I was ever on a webinar and they didn't sell me something at the end, I was actually disappointed. Like I was literally ready to buy. I've been on, you know, a couple of yoga webinars after that. And I was literally ready to buy at the end. And the person didn't sell something. And I actually wrote to this person afterwards and was like, I was so disappointed because I was ready to buy your course on handstands and you didn't sell me one. And the person was like, shit, I never even thought about that. So um, I knew that webinars were really effective. So I, I looked up online, you know, how to use webinars as a sales tool. And of course, I came across Amy Porterfield and she had a course called Webinars That Can Convert. So I signed up to watch her webinars that convert masterclass. I didn't know that it was recorded. I actually thought that it was live. And so I, I watched her um, masterclass on webinars that convert. And I was like, I do not have the money to invest in this program because I knew it was a thousand dollars. Do not have the money to invest in this program? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to watch the webinar and then I'm going to save every single email that she sends me. And I'm going to look at her entire sales page and her thank you page. I'm going to look at her entire process and i'm going to i'm going to use that as my blueprint to create my own without actually buying the program because you know i'm i'm sure i can just figure out what she's doing cuz she's obviously going to do it here she's using a webinar to sell a course on webinars so i was like i'm going to i'm just going to copy that and so i watched the whole webinar of course she, then she presented the program at the end and it was a $1000 and i really 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 wanted to buy and whenever she said you can get access today for only $97 i was like oh, $97 and then she was like with 11 more payments of 97 to follow. It was like, oh, right, okay. But I remember having that initial excitement of that small payment would get me in today. So all of these little reactions that I had, I just noted them down. So what happened was I went through Amy's entire funnel. I, I got all of her follow-up emails with all of the different, if you join today, you get this bonus. If you join today, you get this bonus. And I was like, no, 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 no. I just resisted and resisted. And then I, I saved all her emails and I looked at them all. And I tried to figure out what she was doing with them and how she was selling with them. And honestly, I just couldn't figure out the system. And I, and with how well it was done and how much I wanted to buy, I just remember thinking, you know what? I could try and figure this out for myself or I could just buy the fucking course, right? Just spend the 997, commit to the payment, the monthly payment for 12 months, and I could figure out, I could let her teach me how to do this webinar. And, and I'm going to use that to sell my program because I knew my program was going to be 997. I didn't want it to be $97 or some small amount. I wanted it to be big. And so whenever I got the final email on the final day saying the program was closing, I closed my eyes. I made a promise to myself that I would follow through, follow through. And I hit the buy now button and I purchased the, the program. And so that was kind of how it all started. I did, this was in April, 2017. I had started recording um, all of my workouts the year before and I'd started building out the program. I just, I committed like an hour a day. One thing I'm really, really good at is persistency. And so I committed that I would work on the program or, work, you know, building it for an hour every single day. And I did, I, whether it was in early in the morning or late at night. And sometimes I got to work more, but I committed a minimum of an hour every day to work on building the Sculpted Vegan program and creating it and writing it. And um, and this was in April then, 2017. I had just stood on stage as uh, twice, actually, in my first two bikini competitions and two different shows. And I had placed um, first, second and sixth in my two shows. 
And I then, I so I had the blueprint of what I wanted to create. And I, in April, I bought Amy's program. And she says she, um, I think her promise was that you could make, have a five-figure webinar in three months. So I was like, well, I'm going to have a five-figure webinar in three months. Now, I, I didn't. It took me to, I think I, I set the launch date for October. So it took me until October to launch, right? So that was April, May, June, July, August, September, October. So that was, what, seven months it took me to launch. But I worked through that course day by day, hour by hour, and I figured out how I was going to use a webinar to sell my program. I did everything myself. I wrote all the emails. I wrote all the follow-up emails. I hosted the webinars. I learned how to use the webinar software. I I wrote all of the sales emails. I wrote the sales page. I found people to design the sales page for me. It's how I found Alan, who was my first um, CTO in the company. He still works with us now. He's gone back to being a freelance designer, but Alan was with me the whole way along, um, still is part of the company now even though we have the fabulous Brigitte to do all the design work. And so Alan designed it all for me. We worked together and we launched the first webinar and I made $52,000 in my first webinar. Now, I did all the Facebook ads myself. I had no idea about retargeting. I had no idea about, you know, anything like that. I just, I had only gotten through the course that I had done enough to set up, you know, detailed targeting and to do the ads and stuff, but not to do re retargeting and things. I didn't know any real advanced strategies. And even so, I think I managed to sign up about a thousand people in total to my webinars. Um, and then I ended up making, I spent 10,000 pounds to sign up. Um, and I didn't do any retargeting after the webinar. I, I spent 10,000 pounds signing people up to my webinar. I signed up a thousand people and I ended up, because it was a thousand dollar program, I ended up making $52,000, which was about 35,000 pounds or something at the time, or 38,000 pounds, actually more than that, about 40,000 pounds, I think. So I ended up making 40,000 pounds and I used that money then to pay back the 10,000 to the credit card company. And then I um, I invested the rest, or I didn't invest the rest, but I reinvested the rest. So here's what I did. Because I had a proven because I know I had a proven funnel, I realized that there was a market for my program. Women did want it, right? And they were willing to pay for it. I then hired a Facebook ads company called Dominate Web Media. So Amy then teaches you, once you did the webinars convert course, she te taught you how to put it on evergreen, which basically means that you send Facebook ad traffic to the recording of the webinar. People don't know that it's a recording. You don't pretend it's not, but they don't know it's a recording. And then you sell the program at the end by sending them out timed emails. So I put it on Evergreen, but I really wasn't making, it took me a couple of months to put it on Evergreen. I think um, it was in December, I kind of put it on Evergreen, but I really wasn't making a lot of money from Evergreen at all. And that was kind of worrying me because I didn't want to keep spending money on ads and not making money back. So I remember then um, I found this company, Dominate Web Media, who are now called Tier 11. And I had a meeting with them and I said, you know, this is what I want. And they said, well, we, um, we, you know, have looked at your funnel, whatever it's, you, you do have a great product. The fact that you've already had a launch and it was successful, you know, is important to us because, you know, we probably can do a lot with this, but our minimum ad spend per month is $50,000. And I remember being like, $50,000. And they said, and our fee per month is $8,000. $8,000 a month. That's what their management fee was, plus a $50,000 ad spend. And genuinely, it, the, the thought terrified me. So here's what I did. I went to a friend of mine who's very wealthy, and I asked, could I borrow £30,000? Uh, because I knew the £30,000 would give me enough of a buffer to be able to pay for the ad spend, but also to pay tier 11 and, th and, and also the money that I had already made. And I knew that I could afford to pay back that 30,000 over the next 12 months, even if everything flopped because I had money coming in from the 12 month payment, um, that, you know, people were making for the program. So I hired tier 11 and I remember they took over the account. They changed a lot of things around. They changed the creatives. They did stuff or whatever. They had did a deep dive into the account, cleared out a lot of stuff. And they started, I remember, I think it was in, they. I hired them in January. It took them about a month to set everything up. And they started the ads in March. Now, I, I did my second round of bikini competitions in April 2018. 
And I remember whenever they took over the account, I remember waking up one morning, the first thing I did was always check sales. I remember waking up in the morning and overnight I had made four sales. That's $4,000. Some of them were in full and some of them were, you know, over 12 months. I, I did need the payments in full in order to be able to cover the costs, but people, only about 25% of people were paying in full. And I remember being like, oh my God, I've made four sales. But the thing about it was I started making four sales, five sales, six sales, seven sales, eight sales, nine sales, 10 sales, 12 sales a day once they took over. It was insane how much money I started making so quickly. And I remember whenever I did my show in London um, that year in 2018, I did the, the Miami Pro Show, which I had prepped really, really, really hard for. I dieted really hard for it. And I remember that day I made $12,000 in sales that day of the bikini show. It was like every single time I went back to my phone in between, you know, tan or makeup or hair or, you know, at the show or whatever, there was another sale on another sale on another sale. I made, tw I made literally one sale every hour for 12 hours in that day. And I remember just being like, oh my God, I made $12,000. It was insane. It was just unbelievable once it picked up how popular it actually was. And I was spending about 600 pounds a day on ads, but I was making, you know, I was making anywhere between seven and $12,000, six and $12,000 a day. So even though not all of it was coming in upfront, enough of it was coming up front in upfront to cover the ad spend. And that is really where it all started. And so we continue with that um, from the, you know, just running ads to the evergreen and me servicing all of these new people into the group and whatever. And it was fantastic. That was in April. But then I remember, you know, I just kept seeing in the group, people were like, I know I have to build muscle, but I just want to focus on fat loss, fat loss, fat loss, fat loss, fat loss. This is what I kept hearing. Even though they joined a 12 month program, they wanted to start with a diet. And I remember coming up with the idea of um, the four week shred. Now there's a few things that happened in between. I actually ended up way overspending. I got excited with the money and I like bought far too many things for myself and nice holidays and stuff. And I remember in June realizing that I actually, um, I remember my, my payment for my, um, for uh, my payment for my Facebook ads actually declined and I nearly had a, a heart attack and I looked at my account and I looked at my bank account and I remember I had like less than 10 pounds in my bank account, in my business bank account. And I nearly crapped myself. I'd literally just taken my eye off the ball and spent far too much money. I was actually away on holiday at the time with my family. So um, my best and most productive times have always come out of uh, crisis. And so I shut off all my ads and I just let the money start building up in the account again because that's the that's the most amazing thing about when you have a monthly recurring revenue because a lot of the payments were coming in every month. I just shut off all the ads or reduced the ad spend right down and, that, and the money just built up and built up and built up and built up every day because obviously we'd been selling programs every single day. So on that day, the next month, then the money, you know, the next payment was charged. So the money started to build up pretty quickly, but I realized I had to do something and do something fast. And so I was like, well, they want fat loss. Well, I'm going to give them fat loss. So I came up with the idea for the four week shred, the first ever four week shred. And I launched the four week shred program. Um, I offered a $5,000 prize. It seemed like an enormous amount of money for me, but I knew that money was motivating for people. So I wanted to give them an incentive at the end of it. I launched and I think I was the first actually, I, I don't know anyone who was doing it before me. I was the first to launch an online fitness program with a cash prize. Loads of people are doing it now, but no one's doing it with the money that we're doing it with. We just gave away $190,000 in the Extreme Body Makeover program. We give the winner we gave her a hundred thousand dollars in cash, Elka. And um, second prize got uh, Kerry was second prize. She got fifty thousand, um, and then Misty was third prize. She got twenty thousand, and then tenth, and then Carol. And there was a whole um, and Tia. They got ten thousand and five thousand, and then one thousand for each for numbers six to ten. And so, I launched the four week shred. We made. Uh, a hundred and I think we sold like 1400 programs. I think we made about 130, just under $140,000, 139, like thousand dollars. Um, minus the Facebook ad spend. I couldn't believe it. I literally, after that launch, I think I had like 80 or 90,000 sitting in my account. It was the most I'd ever had in my business account. And the most the amazing thing is that I didn't even intend for this to happen, but I launched that program right before I did a relaunch, a live launch of the Sculpt and Shred program, or the, it was the Sculpt and Vegan program at the time. I did another live launch. Actually, I think I rebranded it into the Sculpt and Shred program. Um, and I relaunched that in two, in 
mm, mm, September 2018, the four-week shred finished just before that launch. And then all of those people wanted something to go into. So I gave them all um, an offer to purchase the Sculpted Vegan program. I did a relaunch of that in September and we ended up making $330,000 in that program. Again, I launched it with webinars. I did exactly the same thing. I did a webinar. I sold the program at the end and we ended up doing 330,000. And then the rest is kind of history. Like the next year was 2019 and we did another couple of runs of the four week shred. We did another launch of this, of the sculpt. I rebranded it into the sculpt and shred. I think we did, um, how many, how much should we do in that one? About half a million, I think in that one. So it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so what we ended up doing in revenue was we did a million in our first year. We did 2.4 million in our second year. We did 4 million in our third year, 5 million in our fifth year, 6 million in our sixth year. And, but then our, our profits or our gross, uh, our um, turnover actually ended up just flatlining a little bit simply because I'm now launching the world's first uh social marketplace for the fitness industry called Only Fitness. It's an incredible new app where basically the reason why I'm launching Only Fitness is because, of course, as I got more and more and more successful over the years, one of the most common questions I was asked was, how can I build a fitness business like yours? Um, And so I tried to teach over the years. I launched the Million Dollar Mentor. I launched Digital Marketing Blueprint. I launched different courses teaching people how to run online businesses, online fitness businesses. But the barriers to entry were just too large and the risks were just too big. Like I had to risk and risk and risk and risk over the years to build what I've built. And a lot of people just aren't willing to do that. Most people aren't willing to do it. So that's why I have created Only Fitness so that people, it's basically like Instagram in how it's laid out and how, except you can upload PDFs and everything to it. But it's basically a business in a box. It's a way that if you have any kind of following online or you're a PT or you have a fitness business, you can basically upload content. You can upload pictures, videos, collections, PDFs. If you have a fitness PDF that you've already created, you can upload it to there and you can sell it through Only Fitness. You can also advertise through Only Fitness. You can boost your posts. You can have them featured on the homepage. You can have them featured within categories. So it's a way that you can, we're going to give you an audience where you can market your, you know, your, your stuff to who are interested in fitness and we're going to give you a free platform to to provide it with you know there's no fee to use it it's completely free to use the only time that we get paid is when uh, is when you get paid we take 20 percent of revenue but you can also link outside of only fitness as well so if you have your own website you can just create a free account and you can promote on it and you can link to your own website as well so it really is a, like an incredible resource so that's what i spent my time and money on in the last year so um, what else do I need to tell you before I finish? I don't know whether this has been interesting to you or not. Hopefully it has. Why, why have I been successful? I basically told you how I became successful. Why have I been successful? Well, the one, two, two reasons. The first one is I'm willing to do what most people aren't. I'm willing to take risks. I am a risk taker. I always have been a risk taker. And the reason why I'm a risk taker is because I genuinely know that what I will do, whatever it takes to succeed whatever it takes. And I always have. There have been some times when I have been in very, very dark places in my business. And many people don't know because I don't share it on social media, but I have been nearly bankrupt once. I have, in fact, twice. I've been nearly bankrupt twice. I have had launches go completely and utterly pear-shaped during COVID. And I pivoted very quickly and we had our best year during COVID because I started creating home programs. We, my business has gone through some really, really, really dark times, but I never let it stop me. I, anytime I'm in a really, really difficult position is actually when I've pivoted hard in the business and I've had to be really innovative. I've like been backed into a corner and I've just had to come up with like a new idea really quickly and, and I've, I've run with it and by God, it has worked. So a lot of people are too afraid to risk. They want to stay within their comfort zones, but the, the problem with staying in your comfort zone is it doesn't force you to think differently. It's only whenever you're in a really, really, really hard situation are you forced to think differently like have you ever been in a a situation where it's been like an emergency and you've really had to think outside the box of all of your options right we could do this or we could do this or we could do this or you've seen it in movies or whatever where people are 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 really in an emergency situation and they've had to come up with like incredibly innovative ways to get out of it 
that's what happens when you take risks in business. You It forces you to think outside the box. And if you know what's going to happen or you know a way you can mitigate the risk, then it's not really a risk, right? <laughs> so you never want to take a risk that is... Um, you never want to take a massive risk, I guess, that will decimate your business. You always want to make sure that you know that if you, you know, work really, really hard, you can get out of it. And I, I don't even know how to quantify that, I guess. I probably could give you some examples if anybody was interested, but I'm willing to take risks where other people aren't. And I've always have been that way. And that's one of the reasons why I'm successful. But the second and probably most important reason, um, two more reasons, actually, the second one is that I am 100% committed to excellence. I, When my customer has a problem, I am driven to fix it. And I don't mean just a problem before they purchase my program. I'm actually more committed to fixing my customer's pro problems after they've purchased from me. If they say something is off, I fix it. If they say something isn't right, I fix it. If they get confused with the, the whether they have to submit their photos on midnight on Sunday or Monday, I don't blame them for not knowing when midnight on Monday is. By the way, it's after midday on Monday. It's Monday night. Um, I just fix the problem. I, I'm always listening and listening and listening and listening to the failure, to the feedback, to what the customers are saying. And then I make improvements to the program based on that. And I don't ask them to pay any more for it. I'm always, always over delivering. I'm the kind of person who over delivers in every single thing I do. It's in my blood. It's in my DNA. I am driven to over deliver. I don't use it as a strategy. It's just who. I am. I am one of life's givers. I have always, always been a giver. Very lucky for my husband. <laughs> so I am a giver, right? And if you want to be successful in business, you have to be committed to a, to giving. You can never punish your customer. You can never say, oh, for fuck's sake, why do they want that? Or this is so ridiculous, like, you know, that, that, that they would want that. Well, they're not going to get it. Like, I'm not going to give that to them. You can't, you know, treat your customers as if they're entitled. They're your customers. You have to take care of them like they're your children. So I am committed to excellence. And I'm committed to over-delivering. But then the third reason why I'm successful is because I listen to what my customers want. I don't create programs that I want to create. I create programs that they want me to create. They want menopause? Great, I'll give it to them. They want over 50 shred? No problem. I've got them covered. They want you know fat loss programs? Great. They want muscle building programs? Great. They want extra coaching? No problem. Whatever it is that my customer wants, flat bellies, bigger butts, bigger quads, whatever it is they want, I'm committed to creating it for them. So I don't create programs that I want to create. I create programs that they want me to create. And that is how you make money, people. Because the amount of times I say to people, oh, you're a financial expert. Here's a program. Here's a problem that I know exists in your market that you should solve. And they go, well, I'm not really interested in that. I'm like, but you want to make money, right? And they're like, yeah, but I want to make money solving this problem over here. I'm like, yeah, you can tell you're a new entrepreneur. New entrepreneurs only want to make money solving problems that they want to solve, right? That is not how you make money. You make money by finding problems that you can solve with your expertise and solving them. That is how you make money. And that is one thing I've always done. I listen hard to my customer. I watch them. I watch them behave. I listen to their questions. I see their patterns of behavior. And then I come up with ideas based on that. Studying human behavior has been one of the most significant things that I have ever done in my life to make me to make me successful in business. Because when you understand humans and you understand how they act and what makes them happy and what makes them sad and what makes them driven and, and why they purchase and how their problems affect them, whenever you can project that, whenever you can try that on, whenever you can really step into your customer's shoes, you know how to reach them on an emotional level. And if you're programs are amazing, which my programs are, go back to point two, I create programs that work, right? So whenever a customer does invest in my program, they come in and they go, holy crap, this is so much better than I expected it would be. I always over deliver in expectations. I love to surprise and delight. And, you know, I'm tough when I have to be and I hold the line and I say to people all the time, no, this isn't for you. Don't purchase it. Like, I'm not afraid. I'm not trying to sell to everybody. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is not for you. Don't purchase it. And so people respect that. And so whenever you understand your customer and then you are driven to create value for them whenever they purchase, you cannot help to be successful. And genuinely being as successful as I am, 
honestly means working like a dog. I, I work like a dog. My husband said to me yesterday, I was lying in bed last night, just having a wee moment, just relaxing, and which doesn't happen very often. And he said something about, you know, will we go out this week and we do something? And I was like, no, I don't really want to. I said, I don't really like spending time with anybody except, you know, the girls in work and you and the kids. And I said something like, no, I don't really like that or something. And, and he was like, you don't like people anymore, Kim. And I went, no, no, I do. I do. I like you. I like you. I like you a lot. And he, and he laughed and he said, yeah, but he goes, your job has made you not like people anymore. And he didn't mean like, I don't like people, but what he meant was I work so much and so hard and I'm so consumed with building my company that when I'm not building my company, the only people that I want to spend time with are my children and my husband. My best friends work for me, like Laura and Christina and Natalie and Maya. They all work for me. They're all like my, and Jamie, they're all my best friends. And Vanessa, actually, I need to name them all now. They literally are my best friends. And so I spend time with them all day. I spend time with my best friends all day, every day. When I go home, I want to spend time with my kids. I spend a lot of time with my kids. I train with my boys in the gym four days a week with three of my boys. I ride horses with my daughter, Maya. We go away all the time in horse events. Ryan and I go away. I have a great work family balance I just don't have a very good social life. <laughs> but that's because genuinely I work like a dog. And so you have to be prepared to show up, get it done, push outside your comfort zone, take risks, serve your customer better than anyone has ever served them or anyone could serve them. Because let me tell you, if you're not willing to serve them, there is someone else out there will be so happy to take them off your hands. So you have to be committed to excellence. You have to be committed to doing whatever it takes. You have to be committed to taking risks, but genuinely you have to develop an enormous amount of self-awareness so that you can help and so that you can understand your customer on a level that very few people have ever understood them before. And that is honestly how you become successful in business. And that is how I built a multi-million dollar empire. We've made more than 25 million, I think, more, probably more than that now actually, in sales since I started the company. And we are only getting bigger. We're only getting bigger. We just netted uh, $650,000 in net profit after expenses were paid for a four-week program that we launched um, in September 2023. Four-week program, we netted $650,000 in net profit after expenses were paid. We're, we are refining and refining and refining and learning from our failures and refining what it is the customer wants and what we can offer them and how we can get them results because that is the most important thing. And that's where we're taking, that's what we're focusing on the business now. We're really, really focusing. We're going away from the high volume and into the results-based programs because really that is that is what our customers want more than anything is results and they want their hands held to get it. So that's where the business is going to next. So if you guys are interested in learning more about where the business is going and you enjoyed this podcast, or maybe you want more specific business strategies, if you do, I'm more than happy to share them with you. Uh, simply uh, go, where would you want to go? Write to me on Instagram and tell me, or um, you could write into customer support. That's another really good way. Um, in fact, if you just go into any of our customer support emails and you just click reply, that's actually the best way because that boosts our email as well, um, our email deliverability. Because when you're opening the email and clicking reply and replying to an email, any email whatsoever, just like podcast idea for Kim or would love to hear this on the podcast, that actually boosts our deliverability because it shows that people are engaging with our emails. So I would love it if you would do that. Any, I mean, just do that anyway. Just find an email, just hit reply and just say, hi, just want to check in, say hello, please tell Kim. I love her and I want more business stuff or whatever you want to say. Um, that would be great if you did that. But if you do want to know where we're headed next with the business and what our specific business strategies are, if you're interested in that, let me know. I'll definitely, definitely talk about that in the podcast. But hopefully you enjoyed this episode. So before you go, what I've got to tell you that we have coming up, we are launching an over 50s challenge called the Ultimate Over 50s Six Week Shred Challenge. Um, it is opening at the end of October. I think it's the 20, 27th of October it's opening. And it's going to be a six-week challenge, uh, which starts in November. It's going to finish right before Christmas on the 17th of December. And you're going to be absolutely shredded for Christmas. But the last week, which it runs from the 10th to the 17th, is not a shredding week. That is literally a getting prepared for what to do next. Um, and it's going to be an absolutely epic program. So if you're over 50... 
and you want to know more about that challenge, then stay tuned. <laughs> Make sure you're on our mailing list. We're going to send out more information to you. But that's what's launching next. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And I hope you have an absolutely awesome week wherever you are in the world. And I will talk to you all next week for another episode of the Kim Constable podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being your awesome selves and bringing your best selves to this podcast every week. I love and appreciate every single one of you. Okay. Talk to you soon. Take care now. Bye.